Alright, let me form some context here. I am a huge fan of the Mana series, with my first introduction to the franchise being Final Fantasy Adventure. Yeah, they renamed the game here in the US, but it wasn't until the GBA remake, Sword of Mana, that I learned about the actual series. I really enjoyed Final Fantasy Adventure, and absolutely fell in love with Sword of Mana. Without a doubt, Sword of Mana is my favorite game in the series, and a fantastic GBA title. Because of that game, I would play any Mana game I came across. Like, yeah, Children of Mana is an okay dungeon crawler with an interesting gem system, and Heroes of Mana is a rather decent RTS, but feels a bit out of place compared to the RPG style of the other games. But I really do enjoy Secret of Mana. Even though the party members can be annoying, the rest of the game is quite solid. Hell, I even like the very underrated Legend of Mana. So, when I heard there was a Mana game for the PlayStation 2, I got really excited, and I couldn't wait to give it a try. As, at the time, I hadn't ever played a truly bad Mana game, and then I saw the scores for Dawn of Mana. Whoa, boy, that's, uh, that's worrying. Well, that leaves me to wonder, is the game really that bad? Is Dawn of Mana worth playing? Well, why don't we find out by starting with the story? The story kinda begins with the spirits of the Mana world. Apparently, they are all meeting up to talk about the origin of the Sword of Mana, because it's important that they know for some reason. Okay, this little setup here makes no fucking sense, simply because they make it seem important that they talk about this, but there's no reason as to why it's important. It's just a needless setup to a story that could have just started at the beginning of the story they tell. The actual story, which is being told by Gnome the Earth Spirit, starts with a young maiden named Ritzia and her friend Keldrick. They both come from a small village on the island of Elusia, which is home of the Mana Tree. Ritzia and Keldrick are running around chasing after one of her pets, when suddenly they notice an evil army led by King Stroud is on their island. Worried that he is heading towards the Mana Tree, both Keldrick and Ritzia head for the tree in hopes of protecting it in some way. While in the Tree of Mana, they come across a spirit child named Faye, who just, uh, follows them now. Keldrick also ends up finding this seed that suddenly grows into his arm, becoming a sword. Not knowing what to do about that, they continue on and find King Stroud. It turns out that King Stroud is actually after Ritzia, the maiden of the tree. With Ritzia captured and King Stroud determined to open the door to Movilla, located at the base of the mana tree, Keldrick chases after him in hopes of preventing his evil plans. Let me just say that an origin story for the Sword of Mana is a great idea. There are three key elements in the world of mana. There's the Sword of Mana, the Mana Tree, and the Mana Goddess. Like the Triforce in the Zelda series, the Sword of Mana is an important piece of the series lore. So I love the idea of a story for the sword. However, this is far from a good story. First, let's take a look at those characters. Ritzia and Keldrick have a decent relationship, at the very least you can tell they are supposed to be friends, but they lack much interaction with each other and don't have much in terms of personality. Keldrick, for example, seems to just want to help Ritzia and prevent the world of darkness. And that's it. He lacks much depth or even much of a proper backstory, and then there are even moments when he can get rather annoying too. And with Ritzia, well, I guess she's better, but you hardly see her at all, so she's rather forgettable. And holy crap, there are like no side characters worth bringing up, as none of them are properly set up and have little to no interactions with Keldrick. Well, Okay, there is Watts, who, for those of you who don't know, is a dwarf who often appears in other mana games. Sure, he's still quite the loudmouthed and danger-seeking dwarf that I love in the other games, but honestly, this is his weakest appearance even compared to children of mana. Though, to be fair, he is the best character in the game. Not only that, but the villains aren't that great either. King Stroud is a horrible and lazy attempt to repeat the Dark Lord from Sword of Mana. He lacks much depth, and his motives are just stupid. Not only that, but he's not very intimidating. He's just evil to be evil, and that's it. Which I suppose would be fine if the story had more of a campy feel to it, but it takes itself too seriously for that. The story just sucks so badly, characters aren't well set up, the story is horribly paced, and there are some decent ideas but the execution is just awful. To better understand what I'm talking about, we'll have to talk about spoilers. Yes, click to the time shown to avoid spoilers as we're getting into those right now. Alright, you ready? 
Remember when I said that Keldrick and Ritzia have a decent friendship? Well, they do, but only at the beginning of the game. You see, it turns out that once King Stroud actually opens the door to Movilia, the world does start to get corrupted by dark powers, and Ritzia gets possessed by Anise. Apparently, Anise was a maiden who first ever opened up the door, and was sealed in Movilia by the masked man who seems to have loved her. The masked man, by the way, is someone who's kind of controlling Stroud. Anywho, Anise pretty much wants to destroy the world, and the only way to stop her is, well, by killing her. Keldrick having to kill Anise, who now resides within Ritzia's body, meaning he would have to kill Ritzia as well, is a sad concept, and could have some character development to it. But it fails since there isn't much development between Ritzia and Keldrick in the first place. Plus, this isn't the only character connection to Keldrick that fails due to very poor writing. You see, King Stroud, that arch-villain to Keldrick, is in fact, wait for it, his brother. What does this mean for the characters in story? Well, fuck all, actually. It's a stupid and horrible plot point that serves no use. It's just there to make things seem more interesting than they really are. Oh, and then there's this dude. Supposedly, he's a friend of Keldrick's who interacts with him maybe, like, once throughout the whole game. Then, Elusia gets attacked and he is believed to have died. A year passes and it turns out he's actually been corrupted and is this dark, evil force, and Keldrick has to fight him and kill him too. Oh no, not him, remember? him, like when he shot some soldiers through the head, which, okay, is actually pretty cool, but can you even remember anything else about this guy? No, you can't. You probably can't even remember his name, which it turns out is Lycus. I had to look that one up. Don't get me wrong, Sword of Mana has a rather clunky story, but at least it developed its characters better and the relationships between them, so that way when bad things happen, there would actually be some impact. Also, that year after jump horribly hurts the pacing of the story. It's just mentioned between chapters, so we don't even get to see the world slowly getting corrupted. Even reoccurring characters aren't used very well, like Trent, Gaia, and Flammy. And at least Flammy gets a cool scene. Oh, and what's with this whole door to Movilla thing? The Tree of Mana is what provides life to the world, and is the home of the Mana Goddess, who is the beloved deity of the series. I mean, sure, there's been some dark things that happen around the tree, but it's usually always been external forces. This whole Movilla thing is never explained and makes no sense. Why is it calling the Maidens, and why is the door at the base of the Tree of Mana? Maybe there was something explained, and I just missed it, but I still find this to be a horrible use of the mythos. Also, what a shit origin story for the Sword of Mana, which is the sword that grew into Keldrick's arm, by the way. In all other games, the weapon is described as a holy blade that has the power to repel evil and was used in great wars throughout the history history of the world. Sure, there are some differences from time to time, which is fine, but for an origin story to one of the most iconic and important weapons in the series, this is pretty pathetic. The game ends with Keldrick killing Ritzia, in which after this Ritzia joins with the Sword of Mana and Fae to become the Mana Goddess. This is a typical ending for a Mana game, but it lacks any importance or impact due to a poor story and characters. My only real nitpick here is that I don't get the point of Fae, like a spirit child was never needed before to turn a maiden into the Mana Goddess. Plus, I really don't like the voice Fae had. Okay, enough shitting on the story. Let's talk about the gameplay. Dawn of Mana is an action-adventure game. Uh, kind of. Okay, so the game is broken up between chapters, that are then divided up between sections. These sections are indicated by these glowing vines found in the levels. It's also at these vines where you can save your game. Basically, the chapters are just one huge linear level that are broken up between individual sections. You will of course be playing as Keldrick, who has the typical kind of controls you would expect for this type of game. He can jump, fight enemies, and that's really about it, and unfortunately, these don't feel that great. First off, jumping is 
really awkward. The second you go in the air, you're pretty much dedicated to going only in that direction, as you can't really change your direction while airborne. Not only that, but the double jump isn't much better either, as it only makes you go higher, but doesn't really help you go any further. Trust me, this is going to be noticeable, as in certain chapters you'll find yourself doing some platforming and it feels so clunky, especially when you end up having to fight against the environment just to get anywhere. The combat isn't that great either, as it's rather sluggish and lacks much fluidity. To be fair, it does work, for the most part, it just feels off. Heck, there's even a lock-on in this game, but even that isn't very useful, mostly because of the camera. Not only will you be fighting off monsters in this game, but you will also be fighting the damn camera. Like, holy shit, this camera is so awkward to control, and will just refuse to cooperate well in certain parts. Sometimes it moves too slowly to see what's going on, or it'll get stuck on an object, or when locked onto an enemy, it will just give you the most annoying, worst angle possible. So then, just how linear are these chapters? Well, most of the time you'll be going in one direction, until you hit a door or a wall that will need a key, then you'll find that key somewhere around these enemies, and then you'll go on and continue going in the one direction. The annoying part about trying to get a key is you'll have to kill every single enemy around you just to find it. Or, like in one level, you'll actually have to backtrack to other areas just to find a key to go to a door that was in a completely different area. This sucks because the radar you have only shows you red dots, which are enemies, blue dots, which are enemies with those keys, usually, and yellow dots that indicate where you need to go. The problem is, you don't get a good look at the map at this radar too, and you can only see the map by pausing the game, but once you pause the game, you can't see those dots anymore. The game also isn't always best about indicating what you need to do or where you need to go because the train and maps don't always match up very well. Some areas are higher, some areas are lower, and sometimes there's a door you completely miss by accident. And trust me, there are a few sections in certain chapters that'll get confusing. The best examples that I can think of would easily have to be chapters 3 and 5, which are just awful about this. Alright, why don't we talk about that vegetation weapon growing on Keldrick's arm for a second. Not only is that plant a sword, but it can also transform into a bow and even a whip. By pressing the circle button, you change the plant into a bow and can shoot some basic pellets at enemies. Should you hold down the circle button, you can go into first person view to get better aim. This is best if you're trying to shoot down certain objects onto enemies to put them into a panic state. Something we'll get more into in a minute here. Throughout the levels, you can find these spirit stones that give you magical pellets that can inflict enemies with status ailments, do some decent damage, and even put them in a panic state. Though, these are best saved for boss fights. I do like this, as it does add some variety to the bow, and it does make it rather useful. Then there's the whip, which lets you grab enemies and objects by pressing the square button, and then throwing them by pressing it again. By throwing enemies at each other, or at other objects, you can put them into a panic state. So what the hell is so important about this panic state? Well, while a monster is in a panic state, which is indicated by these descending numbers over their heads, they will give you medals as you hit them. If an enemy isn't in a panic state, they will only give you one medal after you've beaten them. Why on earth would you want these medals? Turns out, these are needed to increase Keldrick's stats. Red medals go towards health, green medals go towards his attack, and blue medals goes towards his magic. Once you've collected enough of these medals, that stat will rise. This is basically the game's response to leveling up, and let me tell you, it takes quite a few medals to raise these stats. It's an interesting take on leveling up, but I find it to be really tedious. Because of this, you will often find yourself spending quite some time trying to get enemies into a panic state before fighting them. And let me tell you, this game will bombard you constantly with enemies, which makes things go on for far too long. Oh, and here's the fun part. After you've beaten a chapter and move on to the next one, your stats reset to a default level. Who the hell thought of this? Shouldn't you reward the players who worked hard at raising their stats by, you know, letting them keep that rather than punishing them? It makes no sense. 
The environment can also be rather annoying as there are lots of objects to attack and break in levels and the geometry isn't always nice. Sure, it's cool that there's a lot of things you can kind of interact with, but once you get hit with one strong attack and go flying into multiple objects and enemies constantly, you'll find yourself hating the physics in this game. Just take this little area for example. First we have some knight enemies who throw you around with their sword-like attacks, but you also have these orb-like things that when bumped into you can throw you around as well, or just end up being in your way when trying to attack enemies. To make things extra fun, there are also some archers on ledges who will constantly hit you with a stun shot that leaves you vulnerable for about 3 seconds. And then there are some mages who can set you on fire, which also leaves you rather vulnerable. Are we starting to see why this game can get rather irritating? While Faye is annoying, she is at least helpful, as she is the one who will cast magic spells for you. You'll get spells that temporarily increase your attack and defense and stuff like that, but the most useful spell in the game is the healing spell especially since you can't carry healing items with you in this game. Alright, let's talk about the boss fights for a moment here. At the end of each chapter, there is a boss fight, and these will range drastically from tolerable to just plain fucking annoying. Not only are the controls and camera not very cooperative, but there are certain boss fights where it's very difficult to figure out how to make the boss vulnerable to an attack. This is why I recommended leaving your magic pellets for boss fights, because once you enter a boss fight with plenty of magic pellets, you'll have a decent time of always being able to damage them. Otherwise, it's a whole trial and error process of figuring out just what damages them. Some are a bit more obvious, others are fucking hard to figure out beyond belief. There is a fight against a boss at the top of this really tall tower that I don't find to be all that bad, but as for the rest, mm... Plus, in some of these boss fights, the depth of field can also be a problem, as it's hard to tell if you're close enough to even hit them or not. At the end of each chapter, you'll also get scored, which I really didn't care much for. And trust me, the later difficulties aren't worth playing. This is speaking from experience. Alright, are there any positives I can give this game? Well, yes, there is actually. First off, the voice acting isn't all that bad. It's not always amazing, but there are some pretty decent deliveries from time to time. Plus, the music is really good, though that's because the best tracks in the game are themes that are found throughout the series to begin with. Though, to be fair, the original music that they do come up with is still pretty good and feels nice to the ears. It's just that the most memorable tracks are the ones you're going to find throughout the rest of the series. And when listening to these tracks, I just can't help but to think of the better games that I've played and want to play them instead. However, the best part of this game is easily its visuals. While the level layouts aren't very good, trust me, they're either very, very awkward hallways or corridors, and areas are quite repetitive and it feels like you're in the same place constantly, the environments do have some great detail and use of color to them, and just look very lush too. It's amazing to see the mana art style in a 3D game, and it's very clear that the people behind the art direction put a lot of heart and passion into it, and I quite appreciate that. Characters, for the most part, have really good designs to them, and are just popping with color and such fine detail to their character models. The weakest to me would easily have to be the enemy knights, they just look out of place for some reason. Though it is great seeing classic mana monsters in 3D as they look just the way I thought they would. Aside from the main story, there is also an arena mode you can play where you have to kill so many monsters in a certain amount of time. To be honest though, these are boring. I do like the idea that you can buy monster eggs and have up to a party of three monsters to fight alongside you in these arenas. Had this been just flushed out a little bit more or was more like the monster arena in Dragon Quest VIII, then it would have been a fine distraction for me. How it is now, the monsters just don't do much and it's just not very much fun. After you've beaten the game or reached certain objectives, you get emblems. Emblems can be equipped at the start of each chapter. These emblems will give Keldrick certain boosts, like increasing his attack and defense, or giving his sword a holy or fire effect, or even keeping you immune from certain status conditions. These are just to name a few. I like the idea of these, and they're not bad. It's just a shame that the gameplay isn't very great, and that there are some rather annoying sections in certain chapters. Plus, there just really isn't much reason to replay the game to begin with. So, would I recommend Dawn of Mana? No, no, don't ever 
touch this game. Keldrick feels very awkward to play, levels can get confusing, and the panic and metal system makes the game very tedious and longer than it really should be. Plus, you have an uncooperative camera, crap story with poor characters, annoying physics, less than stellar lock-on, and not so great boss fights. Okay, I know I spent a lot of time talking negatively about this game, and that's because not only does this game suck, it's also such a disappointment for me. The game's visuals are just so damn good, and it looked like it was going to be a 3D action RPG with some open world aspects, which would have been so awesome. Like, if I just ignored the crap story, then the game wouldn't be as bad if the controls were smoothed out as well as the camera, and instead of that damn metal system, just give us a regular traditional level up system, and even give a growth tree to improve your sword, bow, or whip skills. It wouldn't have been great, but Holy shit, it would at least been more tolerable. It's such a shame to see this is one of the last mana games out there, and the only 3D one. God damn, what a missed opportunity. I'm sure that the developers might not have been given enough time or money to work on the game. After all, this was at the point where Square started showing some worser parts of their management. But what we got just isn't that good. This is by far the worst mana game I've ever played, and for me personally, it's one of the worst PS2 games I've played as well. That might seem a bit extreme, but sometimes disappointment or misuse of great potential can be worse than just a bad game, especially when it comes from a series that you genuinely love. I don't know, maybe there are people out there who actually like this game, and hey, more power to you if you do, that's great, but for me... I hate this game. While we may never see the series again, at least I still have the older, better games to still play. Alright, next time, why don't we talk about a different RPG, something that's not action RPG oriented, maybe something a bit more turn based. Uh, you know, there is a game that I played quite a few years back that I've been meaning to talk about. Maybe now's the time to actually talk about it. I'll see you guys then, Well, we'll be taking a look at a very interesting, rather niche, at least in America, RPG series. Thank <laughs> you.